So this Pokemon questionnaire meme was circulating on Tumblr a couple of days ago. It showed up on my dashboard and I uh, opted in for it. And how this meme worked is there. there's a list of different Pokeballs and each one has a question attached to it. And if you participate, your followers send you uh, messages, you know, questions with, you know, they list the balls and then you have to answer all the questions that are attached to those balls. And someone went and just threw all the balls at me, so I have to answer the whole list of questions. And I haven't really done any Q&A type things on my channel yet, and so that sounds like something uh, fun to do, answer it in the form of a video and uh, then post it to Tumblr and to answer the meme, so... Uh, first question, Pokeball, what are your top 10 Pokemon? That is a very mean question. There are more than 600 of these. You can't really expect me to pick just 10. I'll answer this by, let's see, what Pokemon would I like to have if, uh, I lived in the Pokemon world? I'd, based on my whims at the moment, uh, an Espeon, a, uh, Superior, or a Snivy, uh, a Quagsire, a Typhlosion, or Quilava, a Flygon, which it would be awesome to uh, to fly on the back of a Flygon. That would be really cool. Or a dragon, or a giant dragonfly, or any such uh, giant flying creature. Um, a Ampharos, and my side team to be swapped in and out as need be would be a Shuckle, a Ghastly. Out of that Ghastly line, I like Ghastly the most. Um, a Azumarill, a what is a Sawsbuck, a Sunflora, and a Lapras. I haven't actually raised a Lapras yet, nor have I raised a Flygon, but those would be very useful to have, uh, you know, for transportation by land and s for by air and by s ocean, and of course you could ride on the back of a Sawsbuck, so I'd be covered for transportation. Uh, what other ones? I like all the Unova starters. Unova is actually the first generation where uh, I like all, all three of the starters, though I like, I really like, I like Oshawott and Duwat's alright, but I like Oshawott more. Snivy line, I just really like Snivy and Superior, not really well about uh, the middle one. And then Tepig, the Tepig line, I like Tepig a lot, but uh, as a, you know, in terms of character design, but the evolutions I'm not really a fan of. If I ever raise a Tepig, I'm probably just never going to evolve it. Okay, Great Ball. Favorite Pokemon game? Hmm. Uh, I enjoyed uh, Gold and Silver a lot. I enjoyed Gen. I enjoyed Gen Two and Gen Three a lot. Even though I think Gen Three uh, went back on a lot of the things that made Gen Two so awesome. But I liked what I like about Gen Three more than anything is the region itself. But I have to. And I, uh, to be honest, I have not played uh, Gen Four yet. I will have played Hard Gold and Soul Silver, but I haven't played these Sinnoh games yet. Uh, I'm gonna get to them sooner or later. It's nice knowing I have a whole region of Pokemon that if I get bored with the games I have, I can go back and play that. But my favorite's gonna have to be uh, uh, Black and White. I have to say that because you know I grew, I was born in New York City. Uh, I live local to the New York City metropolitan area. Incidentally, if the neighborhood where I grew up in were included on a map of Unova, it would be the town on the far right side of Undella Bay with the red spot on it. Of course, as everyone ought to know by now, especially if you've been watching my channel, uh, you know, Unova is based on, on uh, New York and New Jersey. So it's really awesome to have a Pokemon game based on our places I've actually been. Uh, so I, I have to say, uh, black and white, and black and and black and white too. When I get to those, I'm really uh, focusing more on my studies and uh, real life responsibilities before I get to playing black and white too. But uh, definitely the uh, the Unova based games are probably my favorites now. Uh, for a Pokemon game, uh, Ultra Ball. Have if you've captured a shiny, what's your first shiny? The only shiny I've ever caught is the Red Gyarados that they give you for free. And uh, gold and silver. I've never caught a in the wild shiny. Uh, back when the uh, Nintendo World in uh, Rockefeller Center in Manhattan was the Pokemon Center, I did actually uh, download a, a shiny one of the the shiny legendary cats, but I lost that to a my battery on my uh, gold version dying on me years back. 
and that, that was it's weird thinking about that back then. Where the they used to have a ring of where the Nintendo like museum showcase thing is. There used to be a hole in the in the floor that you could see to the bottom level on. And around that ring, there was a guardrail, and there were Game Boy colors posted. And you have to manually connect with the link cable to your Game Boy, and it would download a shiny uh, Pokemon to you. Uh, I think that's how it worked. Maybe they used the infrared on the Game Boy Color. I don't think they used the infrared. I think you did have to use a link cable. No, I think it, I think it was a mystery gift through the infrared. Uh, this was years and years ago. Speaking of, while well, I have an excuse to talk about the Pokemon Center, it's kind of funny because... At the time, I was there like like the week it opened. I went there like maybe two or three times when it was still the Pokemon Center. And actually, that place, I was actually, I'd probably en enjoy that place more now than I would back then. Especially, especially around since back then I was kind of more in like the target age range for Pokemon. But I probably would enjoy that place a lot more now than I would back then. If that place still existed. I mean, they still have po a Pokemon section in the store, but it's not really the same where the whole store is like totally Pokemon themed. Uh, the one thing I wish I did get, they had this plate, you know, like those old blue plates that have the, uh, you know, they'll have like a pastoral scene or a scene of, you know, like, so there was like a plate and it had something like, like a bunch of Pokemon playing in the snow. It was like one of those blue China, those white China plates with like the blue ink on it. And it, and it, what it kind of strikes me as with using my imagination in hindsight is kind of like if you went to your grandma's house in the Pokemon world and that would be like in her China cabinet or something. And I sort of, I'm not big into collecting toys and things, but I sort of have a gimmick for merchandise that could sort of uh, be seen as an artifact from the world of the franchise it represents. So I'd probably really appreciate that. That plate goes for a lot of money on eBay these days. And I've actually seen the plate. It's not as cool as I remember it looking, but it, it would be awesome if they made like a plate, like one of those like, you know, those China plates and it would have like a couple of Stantler pulling a, uh, a... No, not Stantler, uh, Sawsbuck. Stantler is kind of derpy compared to Sawsbuck. I prefer Sawsbuck as my uh, deer sort of ish Pokemon, but pulling a uh, sleigh through the snow or something uh, like that, a sort of little slice of life winter scene, that would be kind of cool uh, piece of merchandise. I'd, play, I'd pay a lot of money for that, not that I have a lot of money at the moment. Uh, so, that yes, that was my first shiny. <laughs> Okay, good thing I'm not uh, debating or anything. I'm not on time limit because it's going to take a little while to answer these probably. Okay, Master Ball. What is your favorite legendary? Hmm, that's a good question. I liked uh, Lugia a lot uh, once upon a time. Like when Gen 2 was current, I liked Lugia a lot uh, because you could fly on it and its design's kind of cool. It's kind of like bird-like, but it's kind of almost, you can tell how aquatic sort of it is. Uh, but my favorite legendary, my favorite legendary, I'm going to have to think about this. Hmm, I don't know. Uh, I get, I, no, I have to think about this, I'm going to think about the movies, because most of the movies involve legendary Pokemon. So my favorite out of those, uh, the, uh, the, sort, the, the form of Giratina without legs looks cool. Uh, the, the form where it has legs is kind of, dumb looking to me but the one where it's just like a giant flying snake thing with like that's that forms kind of i don't know i guess i really don't have too good of an answer prepared for favorite legendary uh i just don't have much of an answer i guess they're cool in general okay next question uh safari ball what was your first ever pokemon game my first pokemon game was pokemon red Played on an on an original model, a uh, giant gray brick uh, Game Boy, and uh, so I feel very lucky to have uh, been around to uh, get into it from the beginning. Uh, the, you know that's just fortunate of you know when I happen to be you know I happen to be around back then. I'm not saying that there's some snobs out there like oh if you played uh, you know Gen two or Gen three as your first Pokemon game you're not a real fan. It's like whatever, that's nonsense. Now, Lore Ball, uh, what introduced you to Pokemon? This is quite a story. I first noticed Pokemon, it was maybe in Game Informer or EGM 2, and back about the time when it blew up in Japan, I saw some screens, they, they mentioned, you know, Pocket Monsters, or, and they, the, it's funny, at the time, Pokemon really wasn't like, 
it was kind of a colloquialism. It wasn't something I, I don't think that was really even embraced yet as an official name for the franchise. So I, I then they didn't put the accent over the E, which I thought was like Pac-Man or something. And I was like, oh, that looks interesting. Because I was just looking at it, it's a monster training RPG and you could, they're two different editions and you could trade characters between them. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Too bad it'll probably never come out in the U.S. And it's kind of funny because even that early on, this is like the first I heard about it whatsoever. This is maybe like probably 97 or 98. Yeah, 97 or early 98. The first screenshots they showed were the very earliest beta screenshots of uh, Pokemon Gold and Silver, which went back when it was still planned to be a, a, just a regular Game Boy game, and it was being codenamed Pokemon uh, or Pocket Monsters 2. And there was a picture of a pagoda that I guess they eventually became one of the pagodas, like I guess the Bell Spirit Pagoda in Unova, I mean, uh, in uh, Johto. And so I saw that screenshot, and I thought that that, I, you know, they didn't really, I didn't know that there, that was, wasn't in the game. I thought that was something that was just in the games. So I remember when I got. When I was playing through Pokemon Red for the first time, I got to... Uh, I'll, the only place I had left to go was Indigo Plateau, which I never even realized... I didn't even think about its location. I didn't think about the fact that I hadn't been there yet until I'd already gotten all the badges. Like, oh, I have to go to Indi Indigo Plateau now. So I thought that when I went there, that it would be that place, like with the pagoda from the beta screenshots of Pokemon Gold and Silver, because... I, I hadn't seen it anywhere else, and I was looking for that area. I'm like, oh, I guess that, that must be Indigo Plateau. And so I got to uh, the Elite Four, and I was thinking like, oh, yeah, when I after, once I beat the Elite Four, I'll be able to, I'll go through, this This is the gate to Indigo Plateau, which is this town where all the Pokemon Masters live. And then I, I beat the Elite Four, and I'm like, oh, yes, I get to go to the town. And then I have to fight Gary, and I'm like, ah. Eventually... I get, beat Gary by sheer luck because I wasn't that great at RPGs at the time. And then I was like, yes, now I'm going to go. Th Professor Oak's going to take me through the gate to the to to the town with the pagoda where all the Pokemon Masters live. And it's like, okay, now you have to enter your name in the Hall of Fame. I'm like, okay, I'm going to enter my name in the Hall of Fame. Then I'm going to go th to the town where all the Pokemon Masters live, like in the screenshot. And it didn't happen. I was pretty disappointed. And uh, then I finally got to uh, go to all those places and when Pokemon... Gold and Silver really came out, and it wasn't really till long after the fact that I realized what had happened, and why I got confused by those those screenshots. So yes, Red was my first Pokemon game. Uh, Lure Ball, what introduced you to Pokemon? I basically just answered that question, but I know when it came out in the, now this is interesting because I genuinely did not get into Pokemon because it was popular. I remember. No, a little after I first read about Pokemon and EGM2, back before there was even any notion of it coming out in Japan, I didn't think it would ever, you know, make it outside of the U.S. There was there was a little blurb in, like, the current news thing, because back then, uh, there was really no internet. Well, there was internet, you know, 97, 98, but it was... If you look at what IGN was back when it was N64.com, it was such a little thing. Uh, Zelda at the time, Zelda.com at the time was a uh, pornographic website. It was not registered by Nintendo yet. It was an actual, it was an adult website owned by some random chick named Zelda. Uh, things like that. And it was, the internet was not like it is now, point being. And so you ha when you wanted to read current gaming news, you had to wait for a magazine to come. And I remember reading a blurb, you know, current gaming news, you know, the, the Japanese, the, uh, the anime adaptation of Pocket Monsters uh, caused seizures in Japan. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, now they're definitely not going to bring that, that cartoon over. And uh, when they did, I remember it was a while. When they brought it over, I really didn't follow it at first. I think my first episode might have been... It, it was either Ghost of Maiden's Peak or Bye Bye Butterfree. It was either one of those two. I know Bye Bye Butterfree was one of the first ones I saw because I just remember seeing like the montage of all the times Ash and Butterfree had together. And I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea why these like cre these weird astronauts and their talking cat are stalking this kid and why they say the same things each time they appear in each episode. Yeah, I thought Team Rocket were astronauts and they wanted to steal Pikachu to power their spaceship. That's what I, I reasoned at the time, whatever. But... 
Yeah, I remember the reason I started watching it. And it was like, in my region back then, in my area, it came on at like 5 or 5.30 on on the WB. And it was like 5 or 5.30. Yeah, it, was, it came on super early. My mom had to wake me up earlier than ever uh, before you know, before school to, to see this. And I was like, and my, my mom is actually the one who said like, oh, there's this new, uh, and I, I was, I wasn't, I was kind of interested in Japan just because I was interested in J Japan. I wasn't really a Japan file. I wasn't big into anime or anything. I was just like, oh, Japan's an interesting country. I'll go to the library and read about them. That's kind of how I was into Japan at the time. It's like, oh, this new, uh, big, this anime came out. You might've heard of it. It's like, uh, Pocket Monsters. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, that's the anime that, cause kids to have seizures in Japan. I want to see that. Because uh, I, I literally, I just wanted to see if I'd have a seizure. So I'm like, yeah, mom, wake me up at 5, 530 or whatever. And so I watched it. And it was either Ghost of Maiden's Peak. It was either the Ghost of Maiden's Peak, Bye Bye Butterfree, or the Magnemite episode. And because I just remember being confused, like, within, if, if there was one of each one of each type of Pokemon, kind of, which I think is something, that I think, like, Monster Rancher might be like that. Or I think a lot of I think Digimon might have been kind of like that or something, where each species is a unique individual. I was confused, or if there were just like animals and there were like hundreds of Pikachu's or whatever. Point being, I I, I basically just watched it to see if I'd have a seizure, and I didn't, and I ended up liking the show. So I started liking the show. I remember the I remember the moment that I decided, and it really no it was popular at school, but no one really talked about it. Uh, it's just. That, I don't know, all right, no, it was probably popular at school, but I just didn't care, so I didn't notice that people were talking about it, uh, so I started watching the anime, and I, I remember back when I first heard about the game, I was interested in the idea of the game, and, you know, the social aspect, you know, it's funny, like, Nintendo was so slow to get into online gaming through the internet, but networked gaming was, you know, what, that that's what Tetris and, you know, the original Game Boy was all about, you know, when you plug in you know, it's an actual physical network cable. It's basically you're making a little local area network when you're playing a linked uh, Pokemon game. And there's something of a, there's a certain sort of, ch like, sort of charm, I guess, psychologically to having your game physically linked and having the actual data go back and forth across this physical network cable between your Game Boys when you're trading or battling. Uh... And made it, and they used that well in the commercial. I remember one of the commercials. They had the Pokemon actually. They had like a guy walk. They had there were there were two kids and they're in, like in high rise apartments and they threw the link cable across as though it, were, it was actually that long and the Pokemon were walking across, and there was the cable over the the alley and that was kind of a cool image that Nintendo used. So they knew like the cable was kind of like a cool visual metaphor for the social interaction uh, aspect of it. Uh, but what was well, I have to check to see what question I was asking. What introduced me to Pokemon? Yes. So, oh yeah, that's where I was at. I was I remember the actual moment I decided to, that I was going to buy. Uh, that I wanted to, to play the Game Boy games. I think it, I just was sitting in math class and I was really bored and I was like, you know what? That, I like that show. I should get the game and relive the stuff from the show in the game. That would be cool. And. Uh, then I got good grades, and um, I was like, okay, uh, t I'm going to take you to, uh, you know, the toy store, and you can get Pokemon. I'm like, okay, cool. And it's funny, when, when Pokemon came out, even back, th like, back then, because the thing is, I'm not saying this to talk down to people who are younger, but it's sort of weird thinking that there are people who are, you know, of age now, who weren't around, weren't, you know, that old, maybe enough to remember when this was going on, but like 98 99 even back then uh handheld games did not get that much respect like in EGM which is the main magazine i read um you really didn't see a lot of game boy reviews like 94 93 95 you see a lot of game boy and game gear reviews at the back of EGM by 99 there was really mostly console games you know console games that went into 3D they had FMVs, and, you know, the little black and white Game Boy, Game Gear was dead by then. It was kind of just, like, sort of like the red-headed stepchild of gaming, nothing really to take seriously, but uh, Pokemon, uh, they got on the cover uh, once for first gen and once when Gold and Silver came out, and when Pokemon came out, they had an actual review of it, and I remember the character Suji X, I don't even know if that was an individual person or just some character they made up, but they were like, hey, like, 
you know, we really don't even care much about the Game Boy and we're impressed by Pokemon. And that's another thing people forget now, is that when Pokemon came out, it was being critical it was being acclaimed just as a game regardless of the social phenomenon and fit the you know merchandising fad it became it was given credit for just being an, a creative game you know a good use of a game that works as a portable game in spite of all the technical drawbacks and the poor graphics that you know cuz if yeah game boy came out in like 89 i think it would have been announced in sometime in 88. I think, like, Consumer Electronics Show 88. I've read stories about how Nintendo showed Game Boy at CES 88. And, like, the people from Atari who had, like, the Lynx handheld, which, you know, backlit color screen, they actually went to Nintendo's booth and were like, this thing is pathetic. This thing's never going to take off. Like, Game Boy was really very outdated, even by the standards of, like, 1988, 1989. And so for this game to come out a decade later and, uh, you know, and become such a hit and impress people saying, wow, this is a great game that makes great use of this function, of this uh, this very primitive system, it's a pretty big deal. And, okay, so that's uh, how I got introduced to Pokemon. <laughs> okay, uh, Moonball. And... Soul Silver, Heart Gold, and SSHG. They worded this weird, like in in Soul Silver, Heart Gold. Time affected the time affected the Pokemon that appeared. They, why mention Heart Gold, Soul Silver? It was Gold and Silver that introduced that innovation. If I yes, uh, I'm and I remember what a big deal all the, all the build up was to Gold and Silver. I ended up ha uh, importing it. Actually, it was the first game I ever imported, and I actually I have my sealed uh, uh po I have I have a no I, I ended up with two somehow I ended up with two Pokemon Gold Japanese Pokemon Golds and a Pokemon Silver one of the Pokemon Golds got stolen uh and then I have a sealed one well it's not sealed because the funny thing is Japanese po Game Boy Color games weren't really sealed it was just sort of a cardboard box and you could just open it and look in so I have a basically mint uh Pokemon Gold Japanese over there still to this day but you know when the news was coming out and screenshots would leak of the, the well not leak but you know the first details about how you were going to have a cell phone in the game back when cell phones were cool and it was built into your wrist watch and you'd have a radio and that's mind you this is when mp3 players were a very very new idea uh, like 98 99 when like the, there was all this build up to yeah it was like 99 late 99 when the build up to uh gold and silver started and there was this rumor that, that you'd have a skateboard and, uh, you know, and they were announcing. It's funny because at the time, I guess, you know, it's funny because really it was very early on in the Pokemon, I guess, life cycle that they started revealing and uh, announcing new Pokemon that would be revealed in gold and silver. But at the time, I guess after about a year or so of being drilled into your head, they even made references in the anime early on that there were only 150 Pokemon, even though they showed ho in the first episode. So to, to think that there are more was, like, s such a big deal. And, uh, anyway, so back to the question. Uh, day and night. Yeah, that was really, I liked that function about day and night. Uh, but time affected the Pokemon that appeared, uh, day or night. Uh, I guess I'd have to say, uh, I really have no preference for which Pokemon appeared in the day or the night. Uh, I guess I like the way. It's funny, even on that little, uh, the, on the simple, you know, Game Boy Color uh, screen. Just the way they, the nighttime when the, the when it was late at night and the, the the game actually you know had nighttime in it, and the, you know you see the light shining out of the windows of the buildings. That added so much atmosphere. It really made it even on the Game Boy Color, a lot of fun to you know envision yourself in the game world. And I do this now to a certain extent, not so much, but, like, those 8-bit RPGs, I really didn't look at the graphics, and I really kind of imagined, like, myself walking through the game world as I played, which is something I think the really simple graphics RPGs, like Final Fantasy Legend, uh, or the, you know, the Pokemon games, of course, or, you know, the Game Boy Harvest Moon, uh, 
the Legend of the River King. Those games, uh, something about the, those really simple graphics made it very easy to imagine yourself walking through the game world. I still sometimes do that when I'm playing the, the more modern uh, Pokemon games or modern top-down 2D-ish style RPGs, but that's something I do. And having the night and the win the light shining out the windows, it made it very, very easy to, to uh, much easier to imagine. Um, you know, because it is a role-playing game. The idea is originally of an RPG is that you're really assuming the role of these characters and imagining yourself in the game world, which is kind of, it's gone from that to just sort of being, meaning something that where the battles are more turn-based-ish, kind of. So, uh, yes, I kind of prefer Knight, I guess. But, Friend Ball. Do your friends play Pokemon? I, I have a few friends that do. It's funny because as... As much as I could talk endlessly about Pokemon, then I'll, I'll meet someone or hear, you know, I have a couple of friends who are into Pokemon, and they'll talk for like 10 seconds. I'm like, whoa, whoa, I have no clue what you're talking about, about, you know, they get real, some of them get real technical into it, or some of them, like, follow the news real closely, and it's like, wow, you've, uh, you've outdone me, and <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, so I have friends that play it. I wish I had friends that played the card, the trading card game. Uh... Uh, th that's yeah. I wish I had friends that play the training card game, but yeah, I, have, I do have a few friends that play Pokemon. I have one that's like an actual sort of fan it, uh, and then I have some friends who just play you know the the games just because you know they're Nintendo games and they're pretty big games on the the DS. Uh, is there anything you hate about Pokemon? That's a that's a good question. Uh, it's let's see. I wish they'd be a little... They, I wish they'd take more... It's a very conservative series. I'd say that Pokemon, the main series of Pokemon RPGs, has evolved less over time. It's remained more conservative and uh, true to the original... Well, not true to... It's been more conservative and reserved and has evolved less than Mario has. Less than how Zelda has. Less than how Metroid has. And it, I wish they'd try something a little more radical. Try, they need to, they, they've, and the thing is, if you go from game to game and study as they've added things and improved things, they've, they've come a very long way, but even, and between Gen, well, I, I say Gen 4 in the context of Heart, Gold, Soul, Silver, I have not played Diamond and Pearl and Platinum yet, I will someday, but. It seems like Gen 5, and based on what I was hearing at the time, and what I even know what I was hearing from Game Freak, was that really Gen 5 was kind of like the single biggest leap, the most radical uh, step between generations of the games. And even so, it's been very, it's been very conservative. And I play the Pokemon games. I have fun playing them. Uh, but the fact remains that this is ultimately... Uh, this battle system, this, uh, the, you know, the way the, the, the battle system, where the battles play out, it's ultimately the same as something that was originally conceived for an 8-bit uh, black and white console that launched in the late 1980s. This is a game that could have, I mean, Pokemon Red and Blue, that game could have just as easily come out in 1988 or 89 when the Game Boy first launched. And for the modern games and you know in the year 2012 to be at the level they are, you know, it's fun. I mean, it's you, you I go back to it because it's fun, but at the same time I wish they were a lot more bold and uh, risk taking. Uh I don't know. I guess my imagination just takes it so far and I guess my imagination I I could that I really wish the games could uh, reflect that more. I like the the top down graphic style, but I wish they would do something more like where you're like how like an Ocarina of Time for like something more three D ish, or maybe have like a three D worldview on the top screen and then like a almost retro act like a, a the lower screen have it be like almost Game Boy Advance style graphics where it's a very simple sort of map where you could look on the top screen and see it in three D or on the bottom screen and see it like you know in, like classic style. But the really the main thing that bugs me about Pokemon is the interface. The interface, as I've said before, the there's no reason for the interface in the the the, uh, the DS games, like the uh, like especially in Pokemon Black. It's the interface is just rubbish. I think 
They, they, they could make so much better use of the lower screen. There should be, like, as soon as they went from the Game Boy Advance to Nintendo DS, for the PC interface and the Pokemon centers to still have, you know, a withdraw function, a withdraw Pokemon, deposit Pokemon, and move Pokemon, there's no reason there should be three options and three distinct modes for doing that. That's something you do on a drop-down menu when your only interface is a D-pad and an A and a B button. Once you have a touchscreen, the whole PC interface should have just been drag and drop in and out of your party, no nonsense, no selecting things. And uh, uh, Pokemon uh, Heart Gold Soul Silver almost they they were almost there. They almost got the the perfect drag and drop uh, PC interface. And I know it was being made sort of congruently with uh, Pokemon Black and White with by different uh, divisions within Game Freak, so they really weren't changing exchanging their data so much. So then I played Pokemon Black and White, and the you know, there's a, the move Pokemon feature where you could drag and drop in and out of your party into the boxes, but it's really clunky. Even in Hard Gold Soul Silver, you have to go through several options just to get to that, being able to drag and drop in and out of your PC. And I should be able to drag and drop items off, on and off of my Pokemon just with the touchscreen without having to really like click a bunch of item icons and stuff. Basically, I think the touchscreen... As far as managing your interface is very underutilized. I hope they fix this for uh, Gen 6 on the 3DS. I don't expect them to, unfortunately. Uh, I'll be impressed if they get it even as good as her Gold Soul Silver was. Something else I had to say about that. Um, yeah, the I liked the C gear in Pokemon Black and White. The functions of the C gear. You know, being able to, to trade with another player just straight out of your box without having to go to a Pokemon Center and go through a bunch of nonsense. All those Seagear functions were great, but it's a waste. And while having a big light, bright type interface looked cool on the bottom screen, it was a waste of space. There are th like three main buttons on the Seagear interface, and those three buttons should have just been three buttons on the side that you could click at at any moment, and then the whole bottom screen should have been filled with additional extra information that you could access on the fly. Like, Pokemon is like the like the, the poster boy game for having a whole second screen dedicated to it, and they really haven't used it as much as they ought to have. <sighs> I think um, the Seeker function should have just been three buttons on the side that I could access at any time. And, like, I played Hard Gold, Soul Silver. Having just your start menu being on the bottom screen was very underwhelming yet it was very useful you should have options on how you want to have your second screen set up and to have the second your start menu then replaced with the c gear which is what it does is useful but you're not using it 99.9% .9 of the time i guess that when you're on a college campus where there are a lot of people playing pokemon having your c gear open and you see po people all around you playing pokemon or in the city where just like playing like on the subway or just at any cafe, you see people around you playing Pokemon, not even line of sight seeing you, but just on your sea gear, then it's kind of more useful. And I guess now that I'm thinking of it, that's something that's probably more meant for in Japan where they're very fast majority of the population lives in urban centers where people are riding the train and playing on the way to work or school. I guess that makes a lot more sense, but the, the bottom, sc the second screen, very underutilized, like in battles, you should, you ought to be able to, uh, very easily look at you know what a move does or what your the power of a move is or your stats uh i like sort of how they have the lower screen in the ds pokemon games especially when you're playing on a dsi xl almost like you know press button you know to choose your move or whatever but for instance there you could choose you could check on a move what a move does or whatever but it's almost like an Easter egg. It's like L and A. I didn't know you could do that until, like, I, last week I learned that someone mentioned it as a piece of trivia. That's when I learned how to do that. But then when you're playing the game, like, for instance, how you can't run from a trainer battle. Therefore, when you're in a trainer battle, like, a third of the main battle screen shouldn't be a huge uh, touchscreen button for running from battle. It should know that you're in a, in a trainer battle and therefore you can't run, so make the other buttons bigger or add another button in its place that would actually be useful. Because, you know, like the vast majority of the battles you're going to be playing uh, through your run through a Pokemon game are going to be trainer battles, so to have a huge button that's totally useless on the touchscreen, it's bad use of interface. Uh, that's... Yeah, so... ...about Pokemon. <laughs>
uh, I could rant about the anime, but I'll have a future question to do that in. Do I keep up with the fandom? I do and I don't. Uh, I tend to stay away from the site. Like, right now, like, as soon as Pokemon Black and White 2 were announced, I really didn't uh, follow the fandom much or go on the boards much because uh, I like to, you know, avoid spoilers. And if I was in, in the, as much as I'm into it to make a video that's already this long, I'm not so much into it that I'm going to suspend my whole life and just to play... And get to get Black Two the day it comes out and play it in like you know in a week, I cannot imagine. I, I just can't don't live like that. Even as much into this as I am, video games are something I do when I have nothing else better to do with what free time I do have, which is very limited these days. Uh, so uh, yeah, I guess I keep up with the fandom. I have one or two boards where I post. Uh, what few fic type th fanfic type things I write. I guess mostly it's just between me and my friends and stuff. Uh, what was my first ever Pokemon? Yeah, I guess it's a Charmander. I really wasn't... Uh, I, I don't know, I wasn't wild about any of the Gen 1 starters, even at the time. I guess I chose Charmander because I disliked him the least. And that's that. Unit was really the first generation where I liked all three starters, even if I didn't all like all of their evolutions, and ended up choosing uh, Snivy, because I liked Superior. As the, the Superior is really the only final form of the three that I really like of the Unit starters. So that was my first Pokemon. My first Pokemon card was probably that Charmeleon they give they gave away in, Ninten in Nintendo Power. Uh, do I watch the anime? I uh, basically don't. Well. I told you how I got started watching the anime. Uh, I watched through the first... I watched through the uh, Indigo League. Then I watched about... I got halfway through Orange Islands, and I got bored, and I was like, this is just filler till they get to, uh, to Johto. And then when Johto started... I remember the day of the first episodes of, uh, of Johto started airing in the U.S. I was sitting right here where I am, uh, playing, what, Super Mario Land 3, Wario World? Wario Land, rather. And I, when the show started, and I was like, okay, Brock's back, this is cool, but this is basically the same show I was watching before, like before, you know, in, in Kanto, except they're in, Uni and in, except they're in Johto now. And I was like, okay, this is a very formulaic show, uh, I know what's going to happen in every episode, this doesn't uh, catch my interest much, and I just sort of stopped watching. I think I got maybe four or five episodes into Johto, and then I stopped watching. Then... I really didn't start, I really didn't, well, I caught a couple of stray episodes of the uh, Sinnoh, no, what is, in the Hoenn episodes, I caught a couple of those just because I happened to be channel surfing, I'd see it on. I was watching the movies, uh, yeah, I was watching, I'll start, I'll talk about the show, then I'll talk about the movies, that's a whole other topic for me. Uh, then when the, uh, the Sinnoh season started, I watched the first, up to the first badge, and it was fun watching the first couple episodes of Sinnoh when it was focused on Dong. It's like, oh, it's like, Ash, it's fun not having Ash in the show. Uh, and before she became a trainer, uh, one of the things I, excuse me, I got an itch under my nose. One of the things I do like about the show uh, sometimes is that you can get very sort of slice of life things that aren't necessarily about the uh, things they're just sort of like everyday life type stuff. And so before Dawn really became a Pokemon trainer, you got a lot of that in the first few episodes of the Sinnoh arc. I liked Hunter J. I liked Pokemon Hunter J a lot. Uh, she was a, one of the coolest villains in the, in the show. Uh, and so I, I basically watched all the episodes relating to Hunter J. And uh, I liked how her arc ended. I won't spoil it, but it's pretty freaking awesome. And it's probably the, one of the gutsiest things the Pokemon anime has ever done. Um, then, yeah, I, and I kind of, I watched the last couple episodes of Sinnoh. And yeah, but it's like, there's so much filler. And it's like, yeah, I'm never going to sit through all this. And I watched the last couple of episodes of uh Sino just to have the lead into uh, Unova, which I started watching when the dubbed episode started airing on Cartoon Network because I was in fact familiar. I knew that Unova was based on on uh, New York City, and I wanted to see how faithful they would be. And 
and I what what really I really didn't plan to watch it. But I like the fact that Team Rocket at the time, well, they they got black uniforms. They're going to be more serious villains, and I was like really excited about that angle. I was excited about the war between Team Rocket and Team Plasma that got delayed or permanently canceled. We'll see uh, how that turns out. I'm, I'm sure they're going to do something with that because they had really good animation, and from what I can see in those episodes, nearly movie quality. They, they, they've got to do something with that, even if they rewrite it. Uh, you know, but anyway, the I was what hooked me on the uh, on the Unova episodes at first was in the first episode of the anime. Uh, he Ash flies into an airport that's near Nuvema Town, and I know like that's where he, the airport he flies into is a real airport. And I made, and I was like, wow, like I actually know where their airport is. And I know they did their research because that airport has been closed since I think the, the 60s. And there's an actual real airport that's like a fit, like a 10 minute drive from where New Town would really be. And when they drive down the parkway between the airport and New Town, I'm like, wow, like that's an actual parkway. You know, when I was little, I just remember sitting in the back seat and actually like seeing these things. And if you look at some of the, the, the Wikipedia article photos on that freeway, they're exactly like shots they use in the anime. So I think they might have actually did some first-hand research. I made a whole video just about that, about the similarities between like those areas in the anime and in the, in the, and in the game. So you can watch that whole video about that. If you care to, I made like a whole like 20, 30 minute video about that. Where I actually go there with my video camera and record it and compare it to the scenes in the uh, anime. Uh, they, of course, that didn't last very long. They, uh, once, once they got through, and I was also impressed when they went to Nimbasa City, I mean, not Nimbasa City, when they went to Nakreen City, and I was like, wow, it's exactly like the real life location. There are the, the train tracks, the cobblestone streets and everything. And I hadn't played the games at that point. So when I first see, when you first see Nakreen City in the anime, and I'm like, wow, I know where that is. They have to be in Dumbo in Brooklyn. And because the warehouses and the, the train tracks down the street. And so I, that's when I realized, like, wow, like, Junichi Masuda actually went to Dumbo, Brooklyn and took photographs there. That's pretty cool. Uh, but once, after the uh, Team Plasma, Team Rocket uh, story arc got canceled due to the disaster that happened in Japan, uh, I really kind of lost interest in the anime. And at that point, even though Ash has been moving through Unova very quickly compared to every other season, I think in Japan he already has all eight badges, I pretty much sort of like, yeah, I like some of, a lot of these episodes. They, I like the way they characterized all the Pokemon, especially, you know, like the relationship between Ash's Snivy and, uh, and what's the, and Iris's Emolga is kind of cool, how like Emolga's sort of like a drama queen and uh, Snivy's kind of like her big sister is like, you know, act straight, I'm not putting up with your BS kind of thing. Uh, actually, I think the Pokemon, the anime works best. A lot of my favorite moments are just like, especially in the Unova series up to this point. I've, I have, I probably haven't seen about half of the episode this, at this point since I lost interest. Though I do watch it if I happen to actually be up early enough on Saturday morning to see it. My, I've been talking so long, my uh, battery's running low on my laptop, so I gotta plug it in here. But... Uh, one of my, my favorite moments in the anime are when they just let the Pokemon uh, be themselves and sort of just act like cartoon animals and just sort of get into antics, albeit with superpowers. Uh, that's really... I think the anime really shines when they do that. And I'll use that as a springboard to talk about the Pokemon anime shorts. I mean, the, the, the films and the shorts that used to be attached to them, not anymore. The Pokemon fil feature films are some... Like, I don't really watch the anime much. I love the films. I, uh, they're not great films, but uh, they're a really awesome guilty pleasure. I guess they sort of uh, something like the something about the atmosphere of them sort of mirrors my uh, dreams of uh, traveling around the world and seeing interesting places someday. Because they often base the locations in the Pokemon films on real life, on real cities, and real locations or landmarks. Uh, so you, and they really put a lot of care into showing these areas and as and how interesting they are and because they have a bit better animation budget they have more time to go through the towns like i think like if they had a, i wish that they could have been a pokemon movie based on a city because nacreen city i mean i've been 
to I've been there in real life. It's such a fascinating place. They could have had a, an amazing, beautiful scenery and a story set there. Instead, they only had like a couple of episodes. And even then, they went out of their way to show how much research they did into the real life area. How Jesse and James mentioned uh, they talk about the train tracks and how they aren't used anymore and how the factories and the warehouses have been built into houses and uh, art galleries and stuff like that. Um, but getting back to the point, I like the the anime the anime move films a lot. One of the things they do in the films that I appreciate is that they have a lot much slower pace, especially in the beginning before the sort of crisis of the film sort of emerges, you know, the villain or whatever. And they have a lot of time to sort of just show a sort of really calm sort of slice of life, everyday life sort of scene in the Pokemon world where they're, whereas in the anime where they have to the plot is introduced immediately and they have to deal with a specific thing or advance a certain goal. They really just show, you know, like in the Zoroark movie, for instance, where they just show someone walking down the street with their mighty, you know, like it was a dog and, you know, talking to their neighbor like, oh, hey, what's up? Is there watering their flowers? And, you know, someone, you know, as the street guard rolls down the street and someone rides by on their bike and it just, it just things like that. And not just in Pokemon, just in fantasy worlds in general, I really sort of have a soft spot for when they show what everyday life is like in these worlds instead of what, uh, you know, the fantastic parts of it, just sort of how, you know, the things in our everyday life that we take for granted, like how we have airplanes and cars and the, and, uh, the internet for those of us who are lucky enough to live in developed countries and, uh, and trains and, you know, electricity and, and uh, these things are so incredible that we just take it for granted and seeing a sort of how everyday life is in a fantasy world where there are magical creatures that, you know, people keep as pets or things like that. It, when you see something like that, it's not, I like fantasy as not a replacement for the real world, but sort of as a juxtaposition for it. Because seeing something that's so exotic sort of, to me, mirrors back how crazy and interesting and worthwhile our own world is. Like if there are other worlds out there that, that, where there are magical creatures or where there's like a steampunk world with zeppelins or whatever, like all any fantasy world, if there are other worlds out there, half then if there are other worlds, then our world has to be at least as interesting and weird and fascinating as those must be to the people who might live in those worlds. That's, and that being said, I love, I like the Pokemon movies for that. Uh, they, they're very, I, I like my favorite Pokemon movie for just for the scenery I like the Zoroark movie um, largely because of the scenery. I like it because there is an indirect connection to the New York City metropolitan area and Green's Kodai being from Nimbasa City, which is sort of like, you know, Madison Square Garden and the Theater District and, uh, you know, in Manhattan. Uh, so there's sort of, sort of a local connection. And the city is just so beautiful. Crown City with the canals and the cobblestone streets and the the uh, the trolley cars going down the street and how the the in this within the city like there's so much you know like a forest almost sort of within the city it's a very fascinating uh, place it's based on Amsterdam but it's like they have rendered it so good and for that storyline where you want to care about the fact that you know all the uh, the, the, the trees and flowers and the, the ecosystem is going to be destroyed in the city if the villain gets his way. It, it's a very good story. I like also like the sort of how the message about, you know, not trusting, you know, mass media messages, being skeptical of what the news is telling you, how the news can lie to you and how trusted media sources can lie to you. It's a very good message for uh, the little kids in the target audience range to have. Uh, I already told you that my whole story about how I, I got to see a screening of the uh the i wish i went to the one for the zoroark movie but i did get to see the one for the pokemon uh white movie which is cool uh, that was a good experience ultimately even though there are idiots you know older than me you know like hooten and hollering behind me uh but that was a good experience and i saw the first pokemon movie in theaters i didn't see the second one i really didn't care enough to see the second one in theaters but the third one uh, somehow I got selected. The, the third one was the first one they didn't really release in theaters widely, but there was a special screening. And one of the cool things about New York, you get to a lot of opportunities that you don't necessarily get everywhere else. So in, somewhere in Manhattan, there was a special screening of the third Pokemon movie. And the third Pokemon movie, uh, it's it was all right. Uh, I like the more recent ones more. Like the last, let's see, it's... It, 
you know, one thing, funny thing about Pokemon movies. Uh, I remember when Pokemon, the first movie, I still have the Nintendo poster, power poster for it on my wall, mind you. Uh, when that came out, and they actually called it Pokemon the first movie, even as a kid, even as, you know, as much as I love Pokemon, I'm like, come on, how how big-headed can you get to actually have the nerve to call it the first movie? Like, come on, you know you're going to make, like, a hundred of these things. Because I remember, like, uh, you know, seeing the original Ninja Turtles movies in uh, theaters. Oh, wow, I feel old now. Uh, I don't know, they're going to make a franchise out of it. But now there are, like, 14, 15 of those movies I think from like the, I I think from the you, the movies that take place in Hoenn, on I like those, uh, the most, especially the, I like the Sinnoh, the arc they had to the Sinnoh movies was cool. I like the Pokemon Black movie. And it's ironic because I tend to get bored in the latter half of Pokemon movies. You know, you know, I am an, I am you know not exactly in the target age range, but I like it. I tend to like the Pokemon movies more when they're just like being scenery porn and you know, walking around and just having an everyday sort of life exploring this interesting city, uh, more so than sometimes even when the actual plot starts and the actual stakes are raised. But one, I didn't like the third Pokemon movie. I didn't dislike it. I wasn't seeing the theater thinking, oh, this is a lame movie. Uh, but I remember what stuck with me about seeing the, getting to see the third Pokemon movie in theaters meant that I got to see the Pichu and Pikachu short in theaters. And I remember being a little kid, and hearing, you know, my parents and grandparents talk about how when they were little, they'd go to the theaters and watch, you know, like cartoon shows. They'd watch, you know, like Looney Tunes and, you know, and Disney shorts and, and like, an MGM and all those classic cartoons in theaters. You know, there was no TV. You'd go to the theater on Saturday or whenever and watch cartoons. And seeing the Pichu and Pikachu short in theaters, uh, that, and I, I like all the, the Pikachu shorts in general. I like the Pokemon just actually getting to be cartoon animals and getting into, you know, cartoon animal antics with superpowers added on top of that. But the Pichu and Pikachu short, seeing that on the big screen in a, in, in a theater with a bunch of other children as a child at the time, and I was actively thinking this as I was watching this, I was like, I was feeling like, wow, this, this is what it must have felt like to, you know, to watch cartoons in a, in a huge theater on a huge screen with a bunch of other children. And that's, and I... What I liked about that short is at watching Pichu, uh, P uh, Pikachu and the Pichu brothers, you know, like, uh, wander around the city and getting, there's this one scene where they get chased by a hound, uh, hound dower and you know, they're, they're, there's like slapstick Tom and Jerry type stuff where like the hound door gets a you know, flower pot stuck on his head and stuff like that. I felt like what I felt like at the time, and I was actively aware of this, this isn't even just in hindsight. I felt like I was watching a, like an actual children's cartoon from the Pokemon world. Like, like, like as though like, you know, kids in the Pokemon world would turn on TV and this would be on just as a cartoon. And so I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And now watching it as an adult, I, I noticed things like, Oh, how they used uh, George Gershwin's Rhapsody in blue. They used sort of a altered version of it as the soundtrack. And you know, and and being sort of nostalgic for when I used to go into Manhattan a lot and seeing them run through that cityscape. And I remember, you know, being in the city and it'd be all urban stuff and all, you know, buildings and steel and glass and concrete everywhere. And then you just turn a corner and there'd be this, this little garden with, you know, a bunch of tires stacked up and all these hand-painted decorations and ornaments. And to see something like that in the cartoon like places I like to go and see all the Pokemon playing it. It was, it was a really great, it was a good cartoon. I think regardless of the Pokemon, connection, I think it was just a good kid's cartoon. Uh, so I've talked about the Pokemon movies now, and that's all from just the question. Do you watch the anime? Uh, when was the last time you played any of the games? That's from the timer ball. I actually, I don't, I, <laughs> this is going to be so ridiculous to hear, but I do not play the games that often. I might touch, I played black and white a lot, you know, early on, you know, just because I was really into it. But even then, I did not necessarily play it every day. I did not, I might have picked it up once or twice a week. I play most, I want a lot of the times I play is when I'm in the laundromat doing my clothes and I have nothing better to do. And it's sort of too noisy to really sit down and read. So I, you know, might play that. I got I did I got a DSI XL just for Pokemon Black just because I'm like yes because for years I had fantasized 
about because think of the time when I was a little kid is when you know the Pokemon Center was in New York City when I was living in New York City when I was you know exploring you know Manhattan and Queens and Brooklyn just to see things you know I'd go to the Botanic Gardens or ride a new subway line because a lot of the subway lines are actually above ground so you get to see a lot and I was like I wish they'd make a Pokemon game based on New York City so when they finally did do that in Pokemon Black and White I'm like I'm I'm going all out for this um you know it's sort of like renting a big screen TV to watch the Super Bowl on which people used to do back in the early 90s when having a big screen TV was a big deal. I would uh, I got a DSi XL just to play it in like the most grandiose way possible. And on the other hand, that did complicate the fact that I had this huge whomping thing that I... <coughs> Losing my voice from talking so much. It's totally worth it. This huge D DS that was so much bigger than my my 3DS just to, you know, just to play it on. But it was worth it. And I... I now I'm playing, I played through black, now I'm playing through white. White's going to be my version where I want to, if I want to restart a game, I could just erase that and not have to worry about restarting my game on my black one. And uh, I played it a few days ago. I mostly play it sort of when I'm bummed out or when I'm really stressed out is mostly when I play. And before I played it about a week ago, I played it for about an hour. Before then, I really hadn't played it in maybe three or four weeks. I do not actually play Pokemon that often. I... Like I said, video games in general will be like the last thing I do with whatever free time I do have. I'll, I'll sooner, you know, just sort of, I, I'd sooner just go out in the backyard and enjoy the uh, the sunshine than play video games, ironically, as much as of a nerd as I'm coming off in this video. Uh, so, yeah, I don't play the games that often. Uh, I'm just scrolling through these questions. What else do I have to talk about? I don't know, I'd like to play Coliseum. I rented it a while ago, uh, years and years and years ago, back when Blockbuster existed and back when GameCube was a current system. I rented it. I'd like to play that someday, even though I don't even really like the Poke the uh, Shadow Pokemon and Purification mechanic. I just like being able to catch what I want when I want and do whatever I want with them aspect of the games. I wish they'd make a game that was... I wish they'd make a Pokemon game that was almost like the films... And, like, you could maybe download your team. You could, I guess, get a rental Pokemon to play through the game with. Or you could maybe download your team from your game into it. And then play through sort of a really condensed sort of adventure that might take place only in one very large city. Where you get to... Where it's not really a badge quest. But you get to... Uh, inter where a very built-up world with a lot of world-building aspects in it. Where it's, it feels very real and congruent. I'd love to, them to make a Pokemon game like that. But they probably never will. <laughs> if there was a question about what Pokemon game I wish they'd make, that would be it. Or if they made like a Pokemon game that was almost like Nintendogs, or a mo they no, it ought to be a mode in the main Pokemon games where you could just interact with and play with your Pokemon. Because they make lots of ways to interact with your Pokemon since Gen three. But I, I wish there. I always love more ways to interact with your Pokemon besides just fighting with them. I wish. They would make an option. There should be an option to be able to have your Pokemon follow you on screen. Uh, and you should be able to choose which one. It shouldn't just be the one that's on top of your list. That's one very good thing about Hard Gold and Soul Silver. That it shouldn't have been just a gimmick for that one game. That should be an option. I can understand that you, you should be able to choose, you know, have a Pokemon follow you and be able to talk to it and see what it's doing or if it's doing something cute or whatever. That would be nice. No. When was the last time you played any of the games? I answered that. Nest Ball. Do many people know you like Pokemon, or do you keep it to yourself? Um, I don't keep it to myself. Uh, I have, like, artwork of myself as one of the aliens from my novel, dressed up, and, and, and I'm dressed up like a Pokemon trainer. So, it's all, like, that's, like, on my Twitter account. Well, it used to be on my Twitter account, on my Tumblr account, wallpaper, and on my YouTube wallpaper and i'm probably going to use that i mean i actually i'm gonna i wasn't gonna do this now i'm gonna put that as the title card for my video now as well uh so i have art of myself sort of as a pokemon trainer and i have in the back window of my car i have like all the Unova starters pikachu uh a seal from kfc and a patchy risu i have all those splashes on my back window of my car and i have a custom made like Unova. A regional ID sticker on the back window of my car too. So, if and I also have a Pokeball antenna topper on on top of it. So on my antenna. So if anyone I uh, know doesn't know that I like Pokemon, then uh, they just aren't really paying attention. And if someone I meet or whatever 
uh, wants to dislike me because of this, uh, because I like Pokemon, then I really, then they can't have been really serious about getting to know me in the first place. Uh, if they want to get upset over something that's really so silly and benign, so I'm really not really worried about anyone's opinion about that. Uh, one op one thing that has happened though, uh, and I know the person who uh, this happened with. Well, it's happened with a few people, but one of the people this has happened with uh, is one of the people who actually asked me to answer questions for this. I love you. You're an awesome friend. You know, you're friends to the end and everything. So I'm, I'm not going to mention your name. I'm not going to embarrass you, but it's something funny that's happened with you and with a few other people. Uh, I'll meet someone, uh, you know, online. Not so much now because now I have my YouTube channel, but before I was really, a, like, before my picture was everywhere on the internet and everyone knew what I looked like, I'd be ta I'd talk to someone about Pokemon. I know them for like the longest time, and I'll talk about this one specific person. And you know, we I we would talk about you know fan art and our fan theories and how much we love the games or whatever. And uh, I posted um, my a, a photograph of myself on my why I don't know on one of, one of the sites I was a member of. I probably DeviantArt, and it's like, oh, that's a funny picture of a cool looking dude with dreadlocks you have as your profile photo. What do you really look like? And I was like, uh, what do you mean? It's like, that that's not really you, right? You can't possibly, like, be that cool looking in real life. I'm like, no, that's what I really look like. I'm actually the... And I, especially at the time, because I, I, I had these prescription glasses that ha that were very dark because I had a headache condition. So they did look like shades. So I looked like this cool dude with shades. And, you know, I'm not the stereotypical uh, gamer, the stereotypical Pokemon nerd, pretty much, I guess by virtue of my physical appearance and my hairstyle and uh, my skin color and everything. So it was kind of funny to have that moment. And it, she, and when she was like, she, she was so embarrassed when I, I, uh, when I real when I was like, Oh dude, like that's what I really look like. So, uh, you know, it's just a, it's just a funny story. Don't feel bad about this. I'm, I'm ordering you do not feel bad about this. It's just a funny story. It's a cute misunderstanding, whatever. Okay. So, and this person's probably like like one of the best like Pokemon nerd friends I have. So, uh, yeah. So I don't keep I don't keep it to myself. I don't go. What I don't do. What I don't do is I don't go around like shoving it down people's throats in like weird places where it's like not. If it happens to come up in a conversation about video games or something, then I'll mention it. But I'm not like I'm not someone who like will stalk some or like I've seen like people like like shove it down people's throats like oh. They'll mention Pokemon. It's like, oh yeah, like I played Pokemon Puzzle League once. It was fun. Pokemon, da 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 da. And I love this and that and that. I'm like, uh, you know, you don't do that. <laughs> that's kind of, that's not really cool. Uh, has there ever been a Pokemon you had difficulty catching? Oh, uh, well, there's those legendaries you throw a billion Ultra Balls at when they have one HP left and they're poison or, or sleeping. Uh, difficulty catching. No, no one in particular I've had difficulty catching. Uh, I know once, I, recently I, I wanted to breed in black, but I hadn't gotten up to, uh, excuse me, I, I automatically call it Queens, excuse me. The post-elite, the, uh, the northeastern area of Unova, the three towns that you get to after you beat the Elite Four in black and white, that uh, I hadn't gotten there yet, and that's where the dittos are, so I had to have a friend trade me a ditto so I could breed. I guess that's, I had difficulty getting that. Uh, dive ball, water or fire types? Um, uh, the main fire type I really like is, uh, Quilava or Typhlosion. Uh, I guess fire one's alright. I never really raised one. I'd, I'd rather have a, Qu a Quilava or Typhlosion. Quilava's cool because he's small and sort of cuter, and Typhlosion's cool because he's, you know, bigger and stronger, but he's also sort of cuddly and softish too, I guess. Or, I don't know. Yeah, I guess if I was relying on these Pokemon for protection from evil organizations, I'd rather have a Typhlosion. I actually have, in my Heart Souls, I have a Typhlosion and a Quilava. And uh, one's the daughter of the other, or something. And I play with them both. The Quilava, I'm never going to evolve in the Typhlosion. I just have as a Typhlosion, and I play with them both. Um, so I guess Fire. Uh, water, the only real water. Well, actually, I, I have I actually have more water Pokemon than fire Pokemon. Looking at this, I, I have I, there's that Azumarill I raised in Gen three, 
Then I have a quag star named Stillwell. Oh, Stillwell is such... I, I, I forgot the moveset because I haven't played Hard Gold Soul Silver, but I made this moveset for, for my Quagsire that makes him, like, he can launch super effective moves against, like, 80% of all Pokemon, just, like, by type weaknesses and such. Uh, so, um, that was, uh, used him a lot in the Elite Four, that was, uh, so, and Lapras, you know, he can surf across the uh, ocean and go to, uh, the UK, because that's my life's obsession, I guess. Uh, but I guess ultimately fire, because if I could only, if I had to choose between having only my, I guess, I guess fire, I guess. Uh, what Pokemon do you think is overrated? Hmm. I don't know. I really don't play Pokemon competitively, so I, I guess I have a lot, lot less stake in this than I do. I, I like, I don't... I guess I'm going to have to say Pikachu, even though that's probably, like, the stock answer. Uh, yeah, Pikachu's everywhere. You know, he's the, the series mascot and everything. Uh, I don't dislike Pikachu. No, the reason I like Pikachu is because of, P of, because of Ash's Pikachu. I like that particular character. Uh, but uh, I'd, Raichu's cooler. I'd rather ra be raising a Raichu than a Pikachu if, like, I was in the Pokemon world. So... Luxury, That's that was the luxury ball question. Heal ball. What animal would you like to... Oh, that... Okay, going back to the what bugs me about Pokemon. Uh, heal balls... They, they, uh, what I really liked was in, in, in near the end of Pokemon Black and White, spoilers, even though the game's been out for like a year and a half already. Uh, when you catch Zekrom mm -hmm. or Reshiram at, in, inside Team Plasma's castle, they let you choose a Pokemon to automatically send back to your PC so you can instantly have uh, Reshiram or Zekrom on your team for the final battle. You should, When you catch a new Pokemon, you should have the option of being able to instantly send one back. You know, that would, that would be very useful for raising the Pokemon you just caught. And that would make heal balls actually be useful because once you have, there right now they're really only useful in the first couple of hours of the game when you have less than six Pokemon, because once you have six Pokemon, you're not going to run around generally with fewer than six just so you could keep whatever Pokemon you catch next, which is when a heal ball would actually be useful because then you could immediately start, you could probably reduce this HP when you went to catch it. So the heal ball it restores his HP. I'm wiggling my nose a lot. I haven't. It's from my nose. Maybe, maybe my uh, nerd senses are tingling and uh, my nose is itching because of that because I'm talking about Pokemon for way too long. Over an hour now, wow. Uh, Dusk Ball. Oh, that was... What Pokemon do you think is overrated? Uh, I guess Pikachu. Even though I don't really dislike him. Uh, what animal would you like a Pokemon to be based off of? There are a lot of Pokemon that... You know what? This doesn't count. Uh, this probably doesn't count. But I, when they made Pokemon Black and White, and they knew that like that the whole Western Unova, like all the whole everything west of the uh, of the peninsula where Castilia City is, all of that is New Jersey. So it would have been cool if they made a Pokemon based on the Jersey Devil, but that's pushing it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess that's my answer because I can't. There are lots of animals. There's no dolphin Pokemon yet. Uh, there's no, what I, what I'd like, you know what, I have, I have a better answer actually. I liked that, uh, what's it, Joltik was the first bug Pokemon, and one of the few Pokemon in general, like the first, Joltik was the first bug Pokemon that's actually small enough to serve as a household pest, that can actually, like, theoretically, like, you just, like, catch one in your house and, like, have to, you know, catch it in a jar and throw it outside because it's, you know, you're just, like, how you... You know, like, when there's a bug in the house, like, I'll, you know, catch, like, if there's a spider in the house, I'll catch it and throw it outside, you know, in, the, in my garden, my vegetable garden, so they can protect my vegetables and things like that. So, like, it's cool to have actual bug Pokemon that are small enough to, to be, like, actual bugs, because most bug Pokemon are, like, you know, like, this big, which is, like, absolutely outrageous for a bug, especially if you live, like, where I do in North America, where, like, a, anything larger than, like, a silver dollar is considered a gigantic bug. Uh, more small bug-type Pokemon would be cool. They just, they just need to fill in a lot of niches, I guess, for creatures they haven't created yet, like dolphins, for instance. Um, heel Ball. Oh, that's what that question was. Dusk Ball. 
do you or did you play Pokemon at night a lot? Well, I already answered that because of... I guess generally I tend to have more free time at night. Yeah, so that's my answer for that. And especially in Gold and Silver when, and when you had the night time going on. And then uh, uh, Black and White walking over the, the sky or a bridge at night is cool. Uh, Dusk Ball, that, or that Cherish Ball. What Pokemon do you love the most? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I guess most of the Pokemon I mentioned would be cool. But, but to me, and then the, the Park Ball question is if you could own any Pokemon, which one would you want and why? Those questions overlap a lot. The Pokemon I mentioned are, I, which Pokemon do I love the most? I, I like all the ones I mentioned. I can't choose just one. But if you could own any Pokemon, which one would you want and why? That would probably be uh, Espeon. Uh, because, you know, one of the cool things about owning pets is being able to uh, hug them and pet them and stuff. And Espeon looks, I guess, huggable and pettable. And, uh, and it would... I, I just imagine I wrote a like I've written fix about espions and stuff and them being very loyal and loving and uh, affectionate and uh, fierce and good fighters and stuff and plus I could teleport to the UK with them. Yes, I'll, yes, all my Pokemon decisions are based on if I could use them to travel to the United Kingdom so I could see the trains. Um, yeah, so that's yeah. I guess espion. I I couldn't choose anything else. Um, now I added a few, that's all, that's, that takes care of the meme proper. I added a few extra questions, uh, that no one specific, uh, just, yeah, let me get comfortable. Um, what is the nerdiest Pokemon related thing I've ever done? Well, aside from making this video, which I did not expect to be as long as it is, uh, this is probably like the second nerdiest thing, Pokemon related thing I've ever done. The number one nerdiest Pokemon thing I've ever done was definitely... Without question, the nerdiest Pokemon-related thing I've ever done is that I've actually traveled to New York City and gone on location hunts for towns and uh, locations from uh, Pokemon Black and White and from the Pokemon Black and White anime. I made a whole series of videos all about this. It's very... I, and my favorite area out of all of those that I've been to is Dumbo and the Brooklyn Bridge and... and uh, and and lower manhattan those are three areas i loved to visit uh back in the day uh when i was in the city more frequently yeah those three areas i loved going back and across you know being in lower manhattan or dumbo and crossing over the bridge to the other side and then crossing back and just you know just loitering and exploring and checking out all the th it's such an interesting uh place that i could it only makes sense that when Junichi masuda went there he was like wow th i need to make pokemon based on because he said when I went to New York City, that's what inspired inspired me to uh, to make Pokemon Black and White based on New York, and uh, Dumbo especially. That's the area that that was turned into Nacreen City. There's actually a photograph on Junichi Masuda's blog where he went to Nacreen City. I mean, to uh, to uh, Dumbo and took a photograph of the train tracks in the warehouse, and he's like, "Oh, look, I'm in uh, Nacreen City." He actually went there in person and posted pictures on his blog and specifically said, "Like, this is the real Nacreen City." And the thing is, even years before that area had anything to do with Pokemon, Dumbo is such a magical place to me. I remember how I first found it. I was just walking, I was going to some, I was just, I just found this place. And I'm like, wow, there are cobblestone streets all of a sudden. And there are train tracks going down the streets. And it's just cool walking down the streets and between the train tracks and thinking like, wow, like once upon a time, you know, a hundred years ago, like steam locomotives were traveling right where I'm standing and there were, you can see the tracks where they the the, tra the train tracks go into the the warehouses before there were semi trucks. You know the train they just roll the train into the uh, the warehouses, and you can see where the tracks would go into the water, where there would be the barges that would take the uh, the the train cars over the river into into Brooklyn, or I mean into Manhattan or into the Bronx or wherever they had, uh, were coming or going from. It's a very magical place, and I could I used to imagine like when I'd go to Dumbo. Just imagine, like, just around the corner, like, maybe there's, like, a window to another world or something like that. I'm the type with a very active imagination. And so when it, those areas, you know, in Dumbo and 
when Dumbo became Nacreen City and the Brooklyn Bridge became the Skyover Bridge and Castilia City became, I mean, Man Lower Manhattan became Castilia City. It's like real, after that especially, it was just really awesome going through this place and, and like, and thinking, you know, when I'm playing the game and I'm like, wow, like I've, being in Nacreen City or walking over the bridge or being in Lower Manhattan and think, or, and thinking like, wow, I've been to these places in real life. I've actually been to, to the real life uh, Nat Green City, the real life uh, uh, Sky or a Bridge, the real life Castilia City. I've been to these places. They're a part of my life, you know. And here I am in the game and and playing in the game world version of these places. And it's it's like I've been there in real life, and it, it gives you this real sort of unique sort of feeling, like like anything's possible. And it really just stokes my imagination up enough to make an hour long video about Pokemon. So. Uh, if I could be a Pokemon, uh, this is a question I've struggled with for many, many, many years. I want to, uh, let's see, if I could be any Pokemon, only recently did I come upon an acceptable decision. Uh, I was thinking, I want to be the, I, I don't, well actually, no, there, there are maybe 20 or 30 Pokemon that would be cool to be able to be, but that, uh, I can make a list. I'm not going to bother making a list. Probably most of the ones I listed earlier is my favorites. Uh, but I w it would be cool. I'd say Ditto just because, you know, it's... The, but I really... I Ditto... It would be cool to be a Ditto and be able to transform into any Pokemon, you know, on a whim. And I, But the whole eyes thing and having the goofy Ditto face, that would ruin it for me. And I'd like to think... When they first introduced Ditto in the anime, it was the plot, the, when they first introduced Ditto in the anime, the anime basically revolved around the Ditto being unable to transform its face, and the idea was that Ditto sh are supposed to be able to transform their faces, so I guess I'd be like a Ditto that was good enough at transforming to uh, transform my face properly. But since then, like, the ditto eyes and mouth sort of became, like, a, a trope, like, a, a way to tell that a Pokemon is, isn't is real, that it's a transformed ditto. And, well, Mew is known for being able to transform, so I guess I'd want to be a Mew, even though I don't even like Mew that much. I guess I'd be a Mew, and I'd, like, at 99.9% .9 of the time, I'd just be transformed into different uh, Pokemon, whatever, whichever one I felt like being at the moment. And uh, I just, I'd just be a Mew whenever I'm about to, tr just, to tr just to go, because I guess he, I guess he can't transform from one Pokemon straight to another, so I'd have to become a Mew again, and whatever, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm thinking too hard about this, which is probably the life story of this whole video. If I could visit any place in the Pokemon world, where would it be? Uh, I'd be tempted to say Castilia City, or, uh, Nac or Nacreen City, just because those are cool places in the anime, but of course, I've actually... I'm lucky enough to actually be able to go to those real places in real life. So I've basically been to Nacreen City and to Castilia City already. And I'm probably boasting about it at this point and rubbing it in everyone's faces who doesn't live in the New York area. So it's, pardon me, you can throw tomatoes at me all you like for uh, gloating about that. I'd say all the places in the movies are really fascinating because they have so much time to build upon them. Like uh, Alamos Town, which is the town from the, the Dark Cry movie. But really, the number one place from the Pokemon world that I'd like to live in or to visit would be Crown City, which is the city from uh, the Zoroark movie. I already talked about how beautiful it is. You know, I, I'd like to go to Amsterdam. I, I don't know. I, I guess I'd go to Amsterdam if I had the chance, but I, I don't have much will to really travel around Europe. I guess I don't have a lot of will to travel to places where I can't necessarily expect most people would speak English. Uh, and I and I think they speak Dutch there mostly, so uh, I'd be kind of afraid to like not be able to talk to people or or whatever. So at least in the UK, they uh, you know they they, they mostly do speak English there. But, so uh, uh, in addition to their own beautiful native languages, uh, aside from English. Uh, so uh, I guess yeah, Crown City would be the place I'd like to visit in the Pokemon world, which is. Kind of those last few questions were kind of self-serving because they're questions I asked myself, but uh, that's my big Pokemon questionnaire. Uh, I ranted on a lot. I'll edit this video down, see how low I can get it, but it's probably going to be mostly posted in its entirety. 
and I have this weird itch under my nose. Uh, so it's probably time for me to do a hush up about Pokemon for a while. I've certainly I've talked enough about it for one lifetime already. So uh, that's it, and thank you very much for watching. Thank you.